Carlin, thanks so much for joining us today and finally getting you on the Modern Soccer Coach podcast. It's, it's good to be on you. Yeah, it's been a, been a while in the making, so it's, it's nice to finally jump on a call. I suppose your timing, just before we started recording there, I was saying that the timing there, I think, is is really important as college coaches. Well, number one, uh, hopefully we're trying to get in, back into a world of semi-normality, mm-hmm. but then also college coaches who have had a long spring season. I'm sure a lot of them were away and taking a break and coming, getting back into the swing of things for the fall and a lot of planning. So I just kind of I wanted to get you on and talk about the analysis processes, analysis frameworks, and and how you would recommend and advise coaches go around that. So the first question I would have would be, what areas specifically can an effective analysis process help a coach? Yeah, so um, as all college coaches know, um, you know, college season is obviously, you know, with the 21st century model that's going to be coming in, it's going to be a little bit adapted going forward. Um, but the college season is so truncated and especially with players having class time and, you know, you have two games a week. Usually if you're not efficient in how you actually deliver your analysis to players and, you know, amongst uh, the staff, um, it's going to be much more of a headache and it's not going to be as effective as possible just because you'll be, you'll be scrambling to, to make decisions, to get insights. Um, so, one way to kind of do that, which I, if I, which I did at UVA, and obviously I, I've done it with the, the U.S. national teams as well, is basically trying to tailor your analysis to something that will actually will actually be actionable on the pitch. So um, if you're a team that, that likes to press high up the pitch, you know, look into ways how you could improve that um, uh, objectively. If you're a team that... Um, that likes to build short on goal kicks, try to find ways to do that. Um, so tailor your analysis to things that you'll actually use and things that can actually um, be trained on the pitch. So instead of focusing on an, an all encompassing approach to how do we make our team better? You know, we're losing matches. Um, things are not going well. How do we actually do that? And just kind of looking at a general area, look on specific areas that, you know, fit your game model and fit ways that you're actually going to make a change on the pitch. You know, it has to be tailored to that or else you're just going to be completely uh, playing catch up throughout the season. Do you think that's where coaches kind of get misled a little bit with, I mean, we always, I I always, the the first time I'd ever heard of a scouting report was when I came to the U S and you're talking 20 years ago and our coach used to write notes on players Mm -hmm. and it meant nothing to me because it was 20 years before we were supposed to go out uh, the right winger was fast. The left yeah. winger was tricky. It was they, sometimes they switched around. Do you think that's where maybe we should be improving now as a coach? Where you said actionable? Yeah, and, and that's that's actionable. Is, it, I, I'll probably say that a hundred times in this pod if this podcast. So I'm not mm-hmm. careful, but and and that sort of thing as well as like obviously y- you want to have a very detailed report on opponents and as well as yourself. Um, but if it's just, if it's a basic sort of all encompassing thing, like this guy likes to use his left foot, you know, they like to invert their wingers, all that kind of stuff, you know, that's just basically a detailed, like a a menu of the opposition. If it's not something that we can actually say, Hey, when we go on the training pitch, you know, match day minus three, match day minus two, whatever time you have to actually, uh, you know, put the players on the training pitch, which during the college season, is it a lot? If you're actually going to say, okay they're going to do, be doing something on the pitch. How can we train that actually you know, with the players, you know, using, you know, I'll get into it later, obviously, but looking at data, looking at video to kind of link those two together. So when you're actually training, you can say, okay, this is how we're going to deal with it. And then when it's match day, you know, it's, it's much easier to, for the players to understand that. Mm. Once you get into analysis and you said video and you start looking at data and you said these name these words keep coming up, uh, then I'm sure there's a lot of and club coaches as well, which I'm sure are listening to this high school coaches that are looking at that, adding more of an analysis data based lens to what they do. A lot of people, I think everyone actually in soccer is is basically understaffed in terms of what they have and what they want to do. They would all want more. They all want yeah. full name X Y and Z majority of them are, are extremely understaffed and extremely underfunded. So let's talk about understaffed as well. How would you yeah. best recommend people go about 
you know, having one assistant and, and trying to maneuver through this. Yeah, so that's especially tough. I mean, I was at UVA, so I was basically a full-time analyst there, um, which I was really lucky. Obviously, not many schools, even at, you know, very top level, are kind of have those resources to them. Um, but one way you can do that is to sort of, it's obviously, and it goes back to, you know, planning your weeks effectively. Um, you know, for most games, after uh, a game on a Saturday or, you know, Friday, that next day, is, if you do have training, is basically be the reserve training. And then that rest of the week is basically going to be, all right, we're already looking for the week. So we can't do a full, full on session that way. Um, so you don't want to become too reactionary after a match which means you're going to have to do a lot more digging in terms of the analysis process. So if you know how you want to play with and without the ball, you know, managing all five phases of the game, I say five because I like to include set pieces in there because they're important. If you kind of have uh, a set um, plan of like what you want to have a look at as a staff, you know, after every game, you know, how did we do building out? How did we do entering the final third? If you have those sort of, there's obviously wiggle room in terms of how the season's going and how players are adapting to that. But if you kind of have a set order of, of things to look at after a match, it makes that go a lot quicker and you're able to coordinate that between undervalued staff. So, you know, i in my, in my, in my experience, you know, head coaches don't usually like to get involved in that. So if you have a voluntary assistant and assistant coach, you can kind of split the duties that way. Uh, and then have the head coach obviously provide his input because that's in, important as well. Um, but yeah, just to kind of sum it up, just like making sure that you're not, you know, completely overreaching your means in terms of, well, you know, we've been really bad on set pieces these last two weeks. If that's not really something that you're putting much detail in and training and, you know, with opposition analysis, it's not something that you're probably going to uh, have to do it, uh, when you have an undervalued staff as well. Yeah, interesting. So now getting into the flow of the week and, and you said there about sometimes the game can take you away and sometimes you can move in different directions. Emotion obviously drags yeah. us as coaches into you know the toughest, probably the toughest coaching meeting of the week is the one after the loss where mm. you, everyone's sitting around uh, and, and it can be a real minefield as, an, as a coach to try and get opinions but then get a, an actual grasp of what just happened. When you when you're working at UVA, what was that? You know, consistency that framework. What did that post game twenty four hours look like? When did you deliver your report? Was there a step back from the head coach? And yeah, talk to us about that there, if you can. Yeah, so uh, it's I forgot who where the study came from, but it was usually after a game, forty percent of coaches and analysts are able to actually actually accurately recall what actually happened in a match so that 40 percent is really low to what they actually think so usually after a match you come in and you know players you know are usually hot after a game and coaches are hot after a game and they look at it and like well we were terrible in this and a very good thing to do is after a game um i obviously coded it during and after the game so the players um and staff were able to kind of look at it in different phases that way but usually have i usually had a big staff meeting where we basically rewatch the game and after the game, there's a, there was always almost always a collective feeling of well that wasn't that wasn't that wasn't that bad actually you know we did a lot of good stuff with the ball you know a couple of moments which is you know usually if you see you're you're gonna lose the match that way um, but usually kind of having a staff get together and you know f obviously when time uh, allows it to kind of sit there rewatch the game and kind of collect your thoughts and with that second helping of uh, watching the the footage you can kind of tailor to tailor the week that way. Um, so if you watched it back and you said, okay, well, we, we might've lost, you know, we, we got a lot of shooting opportunities on goal. You know, we didn't, we didn't, uh, actually score them, but that's not really something that we're going to need to work on this week because we were getting in good positions We a lot of the processes that we want to, to implement in our attacking play were good. Um, but we dealt with transitional moments really poorly throughout the game. And that's not really something that, um, we want to allow it to happen. So you can tailor your week that way and sort of um, within that framework I kind of mentioned um, uh, previously. With COVID, we've seen a lot of remote work and I know you've done a lot of remote work over the last 12 yeah. months. We, I've seen, and, and I might be wrong, it might just be my opinion or my perspective uh, just coming up. I've seen more remote analysts where people are doing work for say a coach and they're based in another country or they're based in another region yeah. 
Um, what's your thoughts on that? Have you seen a rise in it? Do you think it's it's an option for coaches? I, I do. I do think it, we have seen a rise, obviously, with, with COVID times. But as well, one thing I would say is one of the hardest things to do if you're kind of doing that kind of remote work is so much of being an analyst. And, you know, I could sit here and, and look at professional teams all day and say what they're good at, what they're poor at. Um, but going back again to actionable insights, you have to, as an analyst, actually understand and build up a rapport with the coaching staff of what they want to look at. Because when I first started at UVA, I had an idea in my mind of, okay, this is what I'm going to look at for the team. You know, I'm going to provide these insights to the coach. Um, and they didn't really fit in with the game model that we had at UVA. Um, so building up that rapport, you know, uh, KPIs, uh, key performance uh, indicators, basically of, you know, what we like to look for objectively in data and in our video, having that kind of understanding between the coaching staff um, and the analyst helps um, make that kind of workflow much, much easier. If you're working remote, you've never met the staff, you've never met the players, you have no idea what they're kind of looking at. You're, they're just, you're just basically saying, okay, this is a report for the opposition. It, it's not, it's going to be kind of that, that one size fits all report, which doesn't do any really good. It's um, so. Yeah. So uh, college coach, you well know college coaches wear they wear a lot of hats. Oh yeah. And a lot of assistant coaches that I I've spoken to in different ways over the last couple of years, there's, there's always a, you know, well, trying the communication even for an assistant coach at the college level is sometimes tough um, mm -hmm. and facilitating that what what advice would you have for someone who i suppose wants a bit more consistency in that in that post 24 hours to get the coach a bit settled to get that tactical objective a bit more clarity a bit more refined how do they build that relationship yeah so that is one thing as i always learned as Obviously, with the coaching staff, you kind of have to know your boundaries as well. You know, if you're an assistant coach, you don't want to completely, you know, step on the head coach's toes. And, and that's especially true for someone who's doing the analysis side of things. I knew at UVA, and it's obviously you have to build this up with time. I knew this up at UVA where I was basically where my input was wanted. My job is not to come in there and say, hey, we're, we're, we're not entering zone 14 very much in the bot. We need to start changing this in our training. That's not my job. My job is to basically uh, provide them with the objective reasons why we are not doing that and what could be improved in that. And basically, you know, take it or leave it. Not, not really in that kind of sense, but you kind of have to know your role of that team. You, you, you step in when you're needed and you kind of stay in the back and just provide the framework for them to, to analyze and build that. I did have some roles in helping build kind of training sessions. And that was just because they, after a while, they understood that um, my work had value. It was seen after time that they, they saw changes through the, the insights and analysts. And that's well as with basically from anyone who's working under a head coach, you know, you have to know your, your kind of place and, um, I don't want to say you're basically bound into your, your box or your position there, but you, you know when you can kind of come out and say, hey, I think we should change this and you could um, tailor it that way. It's a tough it's a tough balance to obviously go. Um, but if you work with with the same coaching staff for you know, a full season, you, you really start to see where they uh, they need your input, and where they just need you to kind of uh, help them at the side. The scouting in college uh, and um, amateur level in general can be, you know, even like I would say my biggest my biggest progression as a coach over the last three years has probably been in the analysis side mm -hmm. and and more uh, awareness from that there. But I, I like four years ago, I remember I was uh, yeah. mid major division one. Uh, Carlin, I would not look at a scouting report or wasn't interested. Now, you've been in that college environment. How much in a week? do you think should be tailored towards what the opposition are doing or what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think that that's another tough balance to say, but I would say most of that, if you're basically trying to basically play to the, um, and deflect the opponent's strengths on the ball, you're not going to actually, uh, and especially in college as well, you're, you're not going to really gain any insight to your own team. Um, that way so you know at uva obviously it's a little bit different because we were in most games unless we were playing you know some of the other aims teams that you see we were favored to have you know 70 percent of the ball and our job was basically looking at the opponents and saying how can we best uh 
manipulate the opposition so we can score goals that way. Um, there was obviously, we had to do it in a way which didn't leave us completely exposed at the back. Um, a couple games against Pitt is a bad reminder of that ourselves. But uh, I also played at a mid-major. I played at Longwood University in the Big South. So I kind of know that kind of role of you want to be focused on yourself in a way that you're because you don't want to become completely reactive to the opposition. You want to, you know, try to play your football or soccer as much as you can. Um, so I would say that usually the most kind of insight I would say to how do we deflect the opposition strengths, it wasn't set pieces. Set pieces obviously is a, is a great leveler in the game and you have to, you know, be aware if, if the opposition has four center backs or three center backs or whatever who are, you know, giants in the ball. You have a couple of midgets on your team and you kind of have to know how can we uh, best through our marking system or, you know, just how our goalkeeper inter um, claims the ball and stuff like that. Um, you have to understand where um, those, uh, those kind of checks and balances happen. Another tough balance I found is this, and I'm talking to other coaches as well, when, when you're talking about analysis, how much information is too much information. And mm -hmm. I almost think as coaches today, and, and I'd love your thoughts on this, I, I almost think as coaches today, we are assuming that players will get confused by mm -hmm. too much information. Yeah. Uh, you know, do, do you think we should be pushing a bit more? We should be looking almost at periodizing that there at something to try and increase it? I think the biggest way, and it's, it's something we did at UVA as well, is um, you yeah, kind of have to have a um, – I'm trying to think of the words for it. You have to have the, the right phrasing and, and key kind of keywords basically that act as uh, you know triggers in the player's mind. So we have a lot of things like – there's kind of runs that we call the seam runs, you know, runs in between the fullback and the center back uh, relay passes where a, play, a central midfielder comes and drops and opens up is up and um, and opens on the switch. They might not be expressions or, you know, coaching idioms that are entirely reflective of the entire, you know, U S soccer or, you know, coaching license things, but kind of having those kind of buzzwords that, you know, stuck in the players' minds is a good way to kind of implement our game model on the players. So as soon as I put up an analysis report and I use these expressions, players knew exactly what they were going to look for and what they meant. Um, a lot of that was kind of built into preseason, and we obviously built uh, – I built video uh, examples of what our kind of game model was on the pitch. So as soon as the player got recruited for us, we showed them that. And so their understanding of how we want to play with and without the ball. Um if you had kind of had those keywords, you could eventually rank up the, the intensity uh, of how detailed your reports are. I, I never really put, I could talk all day about, you know, the midfield rotations of the central midfielders, the opposition, but at the same time in a game, you want to make sure the players are able to problem solve that way. So I would have little, little, uh, little bits of that in, in the opposition reports. Um, but I kind of did more of that with the coaching staff when we planned training sessions, when we actually detailed what our tactics were, um, sliding that way. Uh, so it's a, it's a fine balance between the two, but like I said, if you kind of have those keywords and players obviously are there for, for three or four years, that becomes a big, big source of their um, insights into that. Budget is, is another, probably the top three challenge for a coach along with the schedule of college year and just the general uh, the yep. game by game by game. Uh, you know, when you talk about data and talk about analysis, everyone probably associates that with high costs yeah what would your recommendation be advice be on limited budget yeah so i mean even for the limited budget you know there's in stat and why scout do a lot of college stuff as well if you don't have access to that there are ways where you can kind of get around that and find basically self code and do objective uh, data yourself. It might not be, you know, specific metrics that you've, you know, PBDA or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, pressure intensity, other kind of line breaking passes, stuff like that. But if you actually find ways through, it's usually through video, obviously, because that's the, the best kind of picture for coachings and uh, for players as well. If you're able to find objective ways of, okay, as a team, we want to make sure that we're breaking lines, through midfield this amount of times per game our our full backs and our our you know we're not playing this amount of square passes in our build up uh I, I like to shy away a little bit from just 
raw possession uh, possession percentages of passes because that's obviously it could be completely just two players between playing passing between themselves for twenty minutes, um, but little bits of of uh, kind of self metrics that I that you do um, as a way to objectify stuff within your game model. So it could be both in possession, out of possession. Um, we want to make sure that our our center forward is pressing the goalkeeper this way, etc. Um, it's not obviously as effective as you would get from uh, I'll be a, a plug here for like stats bomb or something like that, but it's a way to kind of link the uh, subjectivity that you find from rewatching a match on video to the objective side of that you get from data. You mentioned earlier about impacting the the practice and and getting a bit more putting the actionable, go back yeah. to actionable and making that and. What are some ways you did that at UVA and what are some ways you would recommend uh, young assistants or analysts do that? Yeah. So usually we had a kind of a framework at UVA of, of a week of general sessions that we usually did. Um, there was a lot of, a, a lot of wiggle room between that, but a lot of the sessions looked the same, like match day minus one was always, you know, a little bit of shadow play, a little bit of, of set pieces and stuff like that. And kind of detailing the shape that way. Um, but when you actually, um, especially in preseason or in the middle of the week, you know, a Wednesday or a Tuesday of the week, um, there's a little bit of the obviously session planning could be a little more flexible detailing in the opposition. Um, so through that kind of post match analysis that you have in a week, so say you had a week basically where you're you just played against an opponent where um, you weren't able to build up and you basically were having to play into the channel a lot more than you'd like to do. But that next week, you're going to be playing a team that is good at something else. You know, you're going to basically, they're really good at using the wings and attack. So you basically kind of want to tailor it that week. So you, you have your set session details of what you always like to do. But putting a little bit of moments and reminders in there um, of, you know, one session which works on limiting the flanks and making sure that you're compressed in the center or um, detailing how you actually want to press in your shadow play. Um like I said, not, not getting too reactive sort of with how you, you do that, but as well putting in little moments which uh, improve the team week in a week. And especially when you have, you know, a game on a Tuesday and then a game on a Friday, that becomes really important. When coaches are presenting this information to their players, again, go back to attention spans. And now, yeah. do you think we have a responsibility or we should be aware of the fact that, you know, putting, and I've seen, I've seen numbers uh, go up in front of a group of players uh, yeah. i've i've seen heat maps go up in groups of players and, yeah. and it's blank faces do you think we've got a a responsibility now to be aware or, or create better visuals with our analysis and our video when we're showing it yeah and that and that's one of the biggest things there's there's kind of two ways you can do that through obviously film is if you sit, if you put a player and put a, a, an hour long film session for a player, more likely than not after 15 or 20 minutes, they're going to, they're going to shut off. So you kind of want to have to do ways of hitting with that little information throughout the week at UVA. I usually had a film session for them every single day before training, but it was no more than five or 10 minutes. So it would basically be detailing using examples from the opposition or from our own selves of, okay, this is what, this training session is going to help us deal with. So, um, and then sort of examples as well of that in training. I like to, I obviously film training at UVA. So I kind of show examples of previous ones of that. Um, so little hits of film, you know, obviously there's going to be a longer film session eventually in there. You can't avoid it. And it just, sometimes you have to do that. Um, but as well, kind of making the film session uh, as interactive as possible. So putting little moments of there of, you know, a little bit, not humor, but kind of ways of like little games of saying, all right, in this session, we want to try to hit this target of, uh, of goal scored. And, you know, have you, you have a team who wins the session and the team who loses the session um, to make the session interactive. And you kind of have players take uh, ownership of their, um, of their development that way. And in terms of data visualizations, that's important because even with coaching staff members, um, if I showed them a bar chart or a spreadsheet on Excel or something, they would just, all right, okay, what, what can I do with this? This is not really anything I could do. Um, anything up which as closely relates to on the pitch is as good as possible. So if I was detailing um, our final third entries in a match, I would show a pitch match and arrows obviously going to the target that way. Um, so you could say, oh, we were getting a lot of joy 
you know, from this this left half space compared to the right half space. Um, so ways which can kind of connect the traditional coaching side as well with the data side. Coaches nowadays are obviously um, more and more uh, exposed to that uh, at the professional level and at the college level of uh, having video backgrounds and data backgrounds because as they as players saw that themselves. Um, but even then, nobody wants to sit there and just look at a wall of numbers. They want to actually look at something which most closely relates to uh, to data. And if it's not through video, that's those are the best ways to do it. Soccer coaches, a new season is upon us. And you know what that means? Organizing, registering, scheduling, and of course, communicating with 20, 30, and maybe even 40 of your players, your coaches, your parents, your managers, and the volunteers in your club. It's a lot of work, but don't worry. There is help at hand, and that comes in the form of one of the best team management apps around for youth teams. That app is Haya. Using the Haya app will free up more coaching time so you can spend that time where it really matters, helping your players develop and helping your athletes and your people be the best versions that they can be. I've known Haya for a number of years. They've appeared on the podcast I'd strongly recommend that you at least go and give their app a try and pass it on to another coach who could benefit from saving the time on team administrations this season. It's free to download in the Haya app as well as for your team to use. Just follow the link in the notes below or you can simply type in Haya, H-E-J-A, directly into the app store right now. Thanks so much to Haya for all the support. Thanks so much for supporting our sponsors. We couldn't make the podcast work without us. Yeah, you mentioned something very interesting there. The, the training analysis is something that, again, I see there seems to be a lot more people that are now hiring training analysts and people coding training. Mm-hmm. Uh, Miguel Rios was on Twitter yep. today. I thought he had a really interesting post about, about getting more information, more feedback. Mm-hmm. Is that something you've obviously done, something you would recommend coaches look into as well? Yeah, so I, I obviously put more insight in, into my coding and sort of the, the post and pregame stuff and obviously with opposition analysis. But at training, I always did it where I broke down our training. Um, I did it through sports code. Obviously, other providers are available. Um, but I did it through through sports code where I basically had I had a section of our block. So we'd have one sort of session that we would have in the beginning. Um, and I would always tag it with a positive or a negative and the positive or negative wasn't if, you know, if a goal was scored or something like that, like, you know, traditional positive or negative is if we actually got what I wanted to see out of that particular, uh, you know, bout of a session. So like a 30 second bout of training and then, okay, players reset, they change bids or whatever. Um, and that was a kind of a way I did it. So after training, I would look at that and say, okay, these are all our positive moments. These are all negative moments. Um, so when you look at that as a coaching staff, we could say, okay, how can we improve that drill to actually get what we want to see out of that? You know, do we have to change the width of the, you know, the game? If we have to make more neutral players, stuff like that. Um, and then as well for the positive and negative for the players, if you say, okay, this is where this drill didn't work well for us. Um, we're going to do it again. So when I, obviously when I say, when I show it to the, the next training session, we could say, okay, guys, this is, make sure that you're, you know, more spaced out or you're, you know, you're not always uh, trying to play forward when you're, you have to turn, you know, 180, 180 degrees. Um, those kind of insights as well, because the effectiveness in training in college, you know, you're, you're given a, a short amount of time, you know, certain hour weeks. Um, and that makes it all that more effective as well. Fantastic. Fantastic. All right, I'm going to need you to settle uh, an office argument now uh, that we've been having. XG, does it, tra- does it transfer? Do you think it transfers or has relevance to youth and college where sometimes defensive behaviors look a little bit different than it does in yeah. the professional game? I like to look at expected goals at the college level more as basically just a rater of chance quality. So not, I don't like to, um, and basically how we're doing, creating our kind of chances, you know, the numbers are going to be a little bit different because goalkeeping levels. And like you said, are a little bit different. Um, so less care about the numbers, but more as a trend over time, if we're constantly getting, you know, double the amount of expected goals numbers compared to our opponents, we're obviously doing something right in terms of our chance creation and our effectiveness in the final third. Um, and as well, 
when you present it to players as well, because I want to say, hey, don't shoot from there. You know, it's only three expected, you know, 0 0.03 expected goals. We rating it as an area of we play this way in the final third and we create chances through our game model this way. So we can create chances, which are highly rated based on expected goals. So if we're constantly getting cutbacks in the six yard box, which are, you know, 0.45 expected goals compared to shooting pot shots from the top of the D, you know, over time, we're going to score more goals that way. Cause that's just generally how the numbers work out. Cause expected goals is, is based off. Usually models have uh, about 10,000 shots based off of, that data can't be wrong just over a course of time. You know, obviously the numbers might not be as accurate when you have your center forward is, is Jimmy compared to Robert Lewandowski, but at the same time, it's, it's a good way to kind of detail it to them. Yeah. When you, when you're moving from, from theory to practice then, and you, and you, and we've kind of talked about that with session design, um, the XG is just something that you would have where, is that something you would, you would look at forwards. You would, would you, you know, at the, say at the college level, would you look to reduce long range shots? Would you look to reduce crosses? What, what's your advice, I suppose, for coaches? Yeah, I did that at UVA um, a lot. I actually did with one of our center backs as well because he kept on shooting from the halfway line. But um, one kind of way to do that is I always basically gave them our one of our center forwards a a sort of a player profile that I like them to watch. So for Dale DK, obviously. Uh, I basically said, hey, you, you're basically exactly like Romelu Lukaku. You're really good with your back to goal. You know, you can hit the ball a million miles per hour. You're going to operate primarily in the penalty area, and you're also pretty good in transition. Um, so we're, we're going to show you where he scores most of his goals. Using expected goals as a framework for that, basically saying Lukaku gets his goals right when he's square in the frame of the goal. He's inside the penalty area. This is where he scores his goals, and this is the expected goal value for that. Compared to when other players shoot from you know they're wide of the goal no angle outside of the 18 that's a very low expected goal value so basically saying if you make these types of runs if you connect the, with your midfielders that way and get into the areas that lukaku does you're going to score goals that way so expected goals is kind of an explainer that i did for getting in good shot positions in areas which will over time benefit him um I did that the same with midfielders for, you know, kind of key pass areas. If we had a midfielder who was really good at threading through balls in through the back four, basically, um, and this is ex expected assist numbers, but um, you can also use that for expected goals to saying, hey, if you, if you play these types of passes, these are the kind of chances we're going to create for our center forwards. We'll finish up with just a few questions about about analysts in general and just about, again, the, the, the growth of analysis as a community. We've seen stats bomb get involved and, and especially with the Belgian FA heavily involved in, in coach education. Do you mm -hmm. think a coach today who's, who's starting up and going through their, their development, do you think that uh, an understanding and awareness or even, even higher than that there, does it, does an analyst, does a young coach today have to have an analysis brain? I, I think that nowadays um, and I'm seeing it, especially at the higher level of the game, a lot of the roles are kind of becoming hybrid roles. Um, so even if I, you know, if I wanted to get a job as a video analyst, I would basically have to have some kind of understanding of coaching background or data. If I was a coach, you know, more and more players from the academy level at the very top and, you know, and even MLS, you know, MLS, I think it's called MLS Next Academy now, they're getting an insight to kind of uh, data that way and uh, high level analysis. So to kind of keep that, in their minds as well as for your own professional development as many kind of multifaceted kind of areas of the game because if i mean especially at the college level as like, like you said if you're you have one head coach and one full-time assistant you're gonna you're gonna have to double up on those roles especially so if you can do that within that kind of area of you're an assistant coach but you're also really good at analyzing data um those will only help you to improve and you know shoot up the ladder of where you want to get to the college game um, and also as well professional because um, more often than not, if you want to get a job in you know MLS or uh, abroad, you're not gonna you get to try, trying to find a way to, to stand out and connect to players and staff. Um, so getting as much of uh, every kind of everything you can is important. Mm. And you you would you would say the same thing then for an analyst who's yep. more centered on that, get out on the grass, get some experience. Yeah, because. Uh, 
if if you basically if you're sitting on your computer all day looking at video and data and all that kind of stuff and you you don't know how coachings coaches and players actually use that on the training pitch or in the matches it's going to be hard to kind of you know that that word i use again actionable insights to that um so kind of understanding what are the demands on a, on a player and a staff uh to help you kind of connect in that um is really important because you know it's hard you know you it, you get on the training pitch and it's it's really hard to kind of think about everything that you've if you don't have that background and data and it's kind of hard to use that stuff uh that way your roles now I mean, what have you seen trends in the last i suppose if you want to incorporate some champions league that we just that was almost yeah. at the back end of it any anything that that you would see that you're excited with the game trending towards i think one thing is that we've kind of seen and that's this has been a development probably over uh the last five years or even longer than that and we've especially seen in the euros is really really adaptive sort of shapes in and out of possession so you you look at a team shape and you see i'll, I'll use england because they just played um england are in a three four three but in possession they might push one of their you know their their right center backs uh uh walker up higher on the right side it's a little asymmetric so their central midfielder can drop into the half spaces um and from my analysis is I, that's really something important to note because no game is played like that on paper. More often than not, the only time you'll actually see a team in that shape that is listed on the, you know, the TV broadcast is that kickoff. Um, so detailing more about what they actually do in their shape rather than what their shape actually looks like is important. Um, and as well, I can use Denmark as an example who uh, are playing in the next round of the Euros as well. Um, they basically play a three, four, three as well. But Christensen in the buildup phase basically acts as a number six. So that kind of thing is to look at is, you know, on paper, it's very different. Um, and the Euros has kind of highlighted that. You're off to England in a, in a few weeks, you were saying before, a couple of weeks, uh, yep. you know, and, and as the world starts to reopen, uh, fingers crossed and everything starts to get back to, to normality. Is there an environment or a club over there that you're excited to watch, see a little bit of coach that you're excited to see a bit closer? Yeah, I, I, I'm an Arsenal fan, so I wouldn't I won't say us because uh, I'm not really sure where we're going on that kind of side of things. Um, but I think at the kind of, and this has been a kind of a trend in a while, is a lot of teams in England uh, I'm actually looking forward to. Um, I'll, I'll probably say Norwich myself, just because I have a lot of friends uh, who who work in the a Norwich Analysis Academy, um, and I think what they're kind of doing is obviously no team wants to be a yo-yo team, but at the same time, I think Norwich have built their squad and their kind of environment from you know they've, they've upgraded their training facilities like you wouldn't believe, and um, basically making themselves that you know that last time they went to the champ the, the Premier League and they got relegated immediately is is not something they want to happen again. Um, and I'll also throw in Leicester as well, because you know, while they didn't make the Champions League, uh, even though they were in the top four for you know 37 weeks of the season, I think that kind of top down um, approach that they have of, um, you know, they're very, very focused on youth development and bringing in players from uh, abroad who are young, who are undervalued. Um, not I wouldn't call it money ball approach, but uh, at that same level, um, that kind of top down approach of basically when you're the youth academy, we play this way. So when you get into the first team, it's really no difference in terms of uh, playing style. And that also goes to the analysis approach because I, I know I've talked to some of the guys in the analysis academy through StatsBomb and they basically have the same framework for first team all the way down to the U18s and, and younger. Um, and that makes that step up uh, a lot easier to, to make. Yeah, that, that, that younger age group. So our last time I was in England was just before the lockdown. Mm -hmm. uh, Leicester City Insights course. Uh, Ted was there, James was there. There was a, quite a big stats bomb presence. Uh, Arsenal Academy gave a gave a talk on it uh, mm -hmm. on the presentation, and and they talked about yeah le tearing up yeah uh, both physical and tactical data. Uh, it's a it's a tricky one, you know, because you know a lot of coaches will be well, you know, you can't bring this here because they're still in a development stage. Yeah. And, uh, but but you're saying now that there's some some other clubs are starting to do that at a high level. Yeah. And it's as well as you, you kind of have to tailor it. Like you never want you to have, you know, a bunch of visualizations for your U15 players. It's just not really at that kind of stage. I'm, I'm more as, and 
coaching staff and analysts are more basically focused on individual development until you get to a certain level where they have to prepare for the first team. So there's a little bit of, of tiering in that kind of sense of getting more individual performance based uh, analysis than more collective based analysis like you would for obviously the first team the goal is to win matches um, so there is a little bit of difference in that but within the game work and the frame model that Leicester and other clubs of that ilk want to approach fantastic fantastic last couple for you um, again something that that Hey, I had said I asked I asked Ted this in, a, in an interview I did with him last year was we, we told clubs to go ahead and and get I, I'm fascinated first of all I'm fascinated by the analytics community because mm -hmm. I I just have seen it grown yeah. at such a rate over the last three to four years. Ted had said that whenever you hire them you won't hear from them and that's something that kind of like a sports scientist when you hire <laughs> they, they tend to be people that you see a lot you closed off yeah you don't know, get all their all their all their brain power gets kind of closed off in a, in a box yeah so so whenever you know for, for you for young analysts and and obviously twitter is is a great place for just the analysis the part of the community in general yeah. young analysts who who look at going into the profession and, and aspire to work at the highest level What's your advice to them? Where where do they start? Yeah, um, I basically got started in, after I stopped playing in college. I, I basically knew I wanted to stay in, in, in football and soccer, and I, I knew I wasn't really good enough to keep playing professionally. Um, um, so I basically – I had always been on Twitter and just kind of interested in the analytics community. So I kind of started got it off by – I actually was reading Stats Bomb stuff in college, which is, is funny to kind of see it um, go for so full circle. Um but reading really smart people in the analytics community, there's there's tons of them who I interact with, you know, daily and, you know, bouncing ideas off each other is just a, a very very basic step as well. But if you're interested in data visualizations, you know, put it out on Twitter, ask for feedback. Everyone, you know, the analytics community is, there's kind of a from the people who are kind of against the analytics community, which is a, a strange subset of, of football fans on Twitter is 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 basically they kind of think it's very you know shut off in terms of we we're in the know and you're you're not one of us so get out of here um but if you put out your work and ask for feedback um people will always say hey you can prove this um and just seeing other people's work is a really good idea you know i have people asking me questions if i can say hey can you look at this um and provide your feedback and i'm always happy to do that uh online and stuff like that um so just being very very open with your work uh accepting criticism you know you have to kind of be have a thick thing a lot of times i've i can look back at some of the, the first visualizations i made when i first started and they were looking back now they're horrendous but using a lot of the feedback i had from from people uh who are you know working professionally now or you know are still just hobbyist is is a really good way yeah there's a lot Data is, is probably nothing nothing new in the last two years in terms yeah. of every club is investing some form of new uh, uh, yeah. department of uh, with so so say there's thousands of data analysts and working at different levels similar to coaching I suppose what what separates a top analyst in your opinion? I think. I think you you have to have the technical skills as well to sort of you know if you're um, if you want to get into just pure data analysis you know being able to use R and Python and all those various complex program languages are important. Um, but I think the thing that separates it is being able to contextualize it. You can make all those advanced visualizations as well, um, but if they're not really something which is usable um, to coaching staff or players, and um, and that's kind of where the full coaching coaching analysis kind of that wearing many different hats kind of separates a lot of analysts because more and more often, you know, I've seen people who are, who are very, very basic in terms of what they're in basic in comparison to what some of the people who just do pure visualizations are good at, but they're actually able to put it and frame it in a way which a coach can look at and say, okay, that makes sense to me. Um, and that kind of thing is, is simple for obviously like what we've been talking about is putting it on the training pitch, but as well as just basically that instant buy-in. If you can sit there and prove to a coach that you know your tactics and you know, uh, you know your, you know your, your your line breaking balls from your you know your balls into the channel, I guess you could say. Um, if you can kind of show a coach that, you're going to have instant buy-in, and that separates you from the rest. 
it's almost like a paradox or like the irony of like such an objective framework but yeah your, your breakthrough may be something based on relationships or something based on timing or, or intuition yeah like I, I i got my job at uva uh aj barnold who's now the performance analyst for the UN's women's national team i worked uh uva soccer camps and i grew up in charlesville so i knew him and i basically talked analytics and you know tactics and all, all that kind of stuff with him over the summer um and he recommended me to the UVA coaching staff. I put together a little package of what I kind of a, a dummy uh, visual report and as well a, a video based opposition analysis report. And I basically said, hey, I know what I'm talking about. I'll be able to easily kind of take that in. So and that's another th good thing is that the Twitter analyst community is I've I've made so many friends who are in really high places uh, and have you know really helped me along the way. Um, I wouldn't have gotten the job with in stats bomb probably without twitter which is a kind of a funny thing to say but um i did a lot of good at work at uva but at the same time having that kind of public platform to actually talk to people and for people to recognize you is it's really important these days mm. uh, you, you do an amazing job like obviously like, when i got to reach out to you it was about getting it like I, I thought well we'll get we'll help you bump those numbers back that you yeah. lost from your account but i mean you it's a copyright <laughs> <laughs> they get everybody oh but don't even start well, I mean, do you, do you find it hard to to put the time into that there, or is that just something that you see as part of your growing the community, or because like your your work is so consistent and so detailed on it? Yeah, I think I think a lot of that is there's a lot of stuff I I do behind the scenes for for consultancy jobs or uh, for staff. Well, obviously I can't share. Um, obviously I can't share videos for for other reasons, like I mentioned. But um, those kind of things I've done is just because I've been. I've been so used to the kind of the the crazy schedule of college soccer that I've had to be get really good at them and basically do them in 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 like really quick amount of time. So, uh, like for the for the Germany game today, I basically I saw something and I was watching the game, and within five minutes, I kind of had to have that ready and put it out on Twitter. Um, it's 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 uh, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn here, but that that kind of stuff and when you can get stuff done really quickly, but really well and still deliver information. Um, when you're doing it in the middle of a game, it's, you know, compared to Twitter, it's, it's, you know, really important. Yeah. Actually, that's really interesting because we don't really talk about time coach. Blah, 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 blah. We never have as much time as we want, but at the same yeah. time analysis and visualizations are something that the more you do of it, the more sharper and quicker you get. Right. Yeah. It's like when I first started off using uh, you know, a video tool, like coach paint, I'll sit there and it'd take me, you know, an hour and a half to do like a, a quick 30 second clip once you kind of put the time in off um and a lot of that was basically you know after hours you know just as i i'm lucky that i basically would do a lot of this stuff in my free time even if i wasn't working in football it's kind of but still kind of building that time and getting an understanding with the the framework of that and you know as it's the same thing with your if you're learning a, a data programming language if you're able to you know kind of sit there and not have to think about how you actually make the visualization but actually what you want to get out of the visualization is really important fantastic fantastic carlin the, the hour has absolutely flown um i i thank you first off for all the work you do in the community and wish you all the best uh in the future look forward to following the journey in england and i'm i'm yep. i'm uh Looking forward Excited. to uh, for crashing the car on the wrong side of the road a couple times. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. But uh, thanks for having me on. It's been it's been awesome.